Hi, my name is Kimmy Parker. I'm an assistant professor of graphic design at Oakland University, a small liberal arts university in Rochester, Michigan. I'm going to talk today about a very new project that I'm working on with an oral history archive housed in Oakland University's Kresge Library. The Pontiac Oral History Archive contains 22 cassette taped interviews with Black residents of Pontiac, Michigan, collected in the 1970s by Dr. Janetta Brazel, OU Professor Emeritus of History. My collaborator, Dr. Crystal Van Coten, and I discovered the archive in the fall of 2021 and were immediately transfixed by the voices and stories on the tapes. But to date, this archive has been largely inaccessible, available only to those who A, know the archive exists, and B, can make an appointment and come to our campus to listen to the cassettes. Crystal and I felt that making access um, to the archive, to the community from which it comes, was of the utmost importance. For decades, Pontiac was a vibrant city with one of the largest populations of working class Black Americans in the United States. After the auto industry moved much of its operations away from the city, an already disenfranchised population struggled to move forward. Society then, as today, grappled with racism, racial inequality, socioeconomic inequality, and police brutality. The stories on these tapes range from firsthand accounts of the Great Migration, to industrial working conditions, to racist encounters, to social and family life in the 1970s. The voices of everyday people, particularly people of color, too often go unheard. Access to these stories is one way that we can move in the direction of a more equitable and empathetic society. Initially, we set out to find funding to get the cassette tapes digitized and transcribed, with the ultimate goal of publishing them to a public-facing website. We received a Judd Family Foundation grant through Oakland University in May of 2022, and the digitization process is now underway. But we realized that before publishing, we also needed to obtain permissions. No consent forms were obtained from interviewees in the 70s when the original interviews were conducted, and all of the interviewees have since passed away. Best practices in oral history recommend a good faith effort to locate the interviewees' descendants and obtain permission to publish, which is what we've been working on for the past six months. Through that process, living relatives have shared photographs, handmade maps of Black-owned businesses and social life in Pontiac from the 70s, newspaper clippings that reference people and places and stories on the tapes, obituaries, wedding announcements, and other artifacts. These pieces of visual context further enrich the stories and the voices on the tapes and reveal surprising social connections between the interviewees themselves. Please note that I've used an image here from the Smithsonian Magazine as an example of the type of photos that have been shared with us. Since we're still in the process of gaining um, or gathering permissions, it really wouldn't be ethical for us to share or publish what we've collected until that work is complete. We've also built quite the web of collaboration from community organizations like the Pontiac Historical Society to national resources like the H Oral History Listserv, and new friends like Dr. Brazel and Living Relatives, to internal partners like our library and current Oakland University professors of history. We've also engaged students in Crystal's podcasting course who have created three episodes in a series that utilizes clips from the archive and provides historical context. The project hasn't been without its challenges, however. Our library uses a platform called OHMS, Oral History Metadata Synchronizer, to house projects like this. As you can see here, this is not the rich visual and contextual experience we're going for. We're currently seeking a coding enthusiast to collaborate with on making the site much more engaging. So why am I talking about this 
project at a design focused colloquium. On the surface, it's not a design project. It's public scholarship, interdisciplinary intellectual work that seeks to produce a public good. It lives at the center of the definition of the humanities, the study of the human world and society from a critical perspective. It's community service. But if your definition of graphic design contains any of these key words, connection, communication, audience, context, then this certainly is a design project after all. We all know that design is a multidisciplinary, human-centered activity and increasingly operates outside narrow categories such as motion design, communication design, interaction design. Today's uh, designers should be able to make connections between theory and form, process and outcome, people and communities. Consequently, I believe this is a design project, one in which design methodologies are used as a tool for cultural understanding and technology as a medium for communication and connection. This interdisciplinary and wide-ranging process has become much more than a design project. This work lives at the intersection of design, community activism, historical preservation, and storytelling. What opportunities might exist in your community? What other stories need to be told? Thank you.